What's up, Gorilla Social Workers? Welcome to the Gorilla Social Work Podcast with your hosts, the Scarlet Fever himself, Jeff Moore, and yours faithfully, Mace Warren. Jeff and I are both licensed clinical social workers who specialize in providing forensic psychotherapy to clients involved in the criminal justice system. We love talking about our work and sharing our conversations with all of you. If you haven't already, take a minute, give us a five-star rating, subscribe, and share with a friend. I saw a bunch of new subscriptions this month, so thank you. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Prime Polygraph Services. Prime Polygraph is here to provide clients with evidence-based, professional, and accurate polygraph examinations. Prime Polygraph provides fidelity examinations, pre-employment, and court-ordered examinations. Ladies, bros, you think your significant other's fooling around behind their back? Well, prove it! With a fidelity examination at Prime Polygraph Services, visit their website at www.primepolygraph.com. This will be our last episode of the of the year. Jeff and I have been working hard to crank out episodes regularly and on time, and we will be taking a Christmas break. In the spirit of the season, we have a discussion about a more effective way to give to charities and make sure you get more bang for your buck. We love you guys. Enjoy the episode. We don't have any start music this time to go off of. We're just jumping right in, huh? Well, I haven't done the in- I haven't done the intro yet. Oh. So I mean, I'm kind of. I wasn't. I haven't been inspired enough to get your your uh, your nickname for this <laughs> go around. So, dude, the, the last one, I fox piss. Yeah, dude. well, because when I when I listened to the uh, the recording of, it, I just went to the YouTube where there isn't the introduction, and right. then Nita had. Uh, called me that fox piss or whatever it was like yeah where is that from? oh mace <laughs> <laughs> <Son of> a... <laughs> do you have do you have like a, a database of redhead nicknames or are you just oh, that yeah. clever oh yeah uh, no 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 i don't come on i just you don't th- sit around thinking all I day of what smarter, to call me <laughs> harder yeah i'm not doing any of that yeah. stuff yeah there's uh there there's a few databases for like slandering other people like <laughs> there's i mean there really is there's there's a there's one. I'm not a huge proponent of it, but do you remember the uh, – like I'm not promoting it, but it does exist. And if you go on there, the amount of information on there is just mind-boggling. Do you remember when I showed you the racial slur database? That's right. Dude. And it's like uh, – I swear it has like a .org thing too. .org. <laughs> RSDB.org or something like it. So, yeah. But I went on there and I was like, what? And, and these were – but it's um you know what's fascinating about it that I thought was at least like because if you ever like heard a racial slur and then you're like where does that come from you ever heard like oh yeah for sure yeah I, I don't even know the origins of right. those things right so what's what's kind of compelling about it is you go on there and then it has the racial slur and then it says the origins. <laughs> Like, so the, the like date and then the meaning behind it. Cause I've always, so that's actually how I, that's actually how I, I, I found it was because I can't remember how, oh yeah, yeah. It was, um, I was looking up the origins of our, 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 uh, good friend, Ed, our po- polygraph examiner. He is, uh, he's a, of Italian descent. And I think he was talking about a few slurs. I was like, where did that even come from? That doesn't even make any sense. And then I looked it up, and then it brought me to there, and I was like, "Whoa!" Look and it at actually this. gives you the reason why yeah. those slurs exist. So if ever you've been curious, I mean, that's just yeah. It's just, oh. again, I'm not endorsing racial slurs, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just saying <laughs> there are databases out there. It's educational. Yeah, it's educational. If ever it's historical, or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. And yeah. then of course, if you want to insult redheads then, then that's it so no, we open up talking about racial slurs on a social work podcast huh? yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah yeah we gotta boost these yeah. subscribes yeah, yeah what was this yeah speaking of which what was that thing that you and brett were talking about like uh i don't know when you're doing intros to like smash the like button or so what, what oh yeah uh yeah smash the like button and subscribe like, just say that yeah, yeah, I think you're supposed to say that. Yeah, hey yeah, guys, I want you to go ahead and uh, hit the uh, smash the like button, subscribe, and click the bell. We want uh, we want our notifications alerted. It's just you like guys had a word for it, though, didn't you? Wasn't there like a, a a phrase for it or a term for it? I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Well, but I swear it's everybody says the same thing. But Brett said something, and then you said, "Oh yeah, I know what he's talking about." I mean, I know they do say that. My daughter says that. God, she's recording with. fake YouTube videos. Yeah, it's the cutest yeah. thing on the planet. <laughs> so I hit that subscribe button. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. It, if there's a term, like, I Like, sweetheart, don't. I'll never. I, I would. I was talking You're, to I'm not subscribing to your YouTube channel, darling. Well, not not just that, but it it's probably for everybody's best interest. I was talking to uh, John about this. Uh, John is one of our work buddies. And, um, can you, so I was just thinking like, so yeah, you could do that, but then have you ever, you probably don't watch any of those channels, but if you have young kids, you know what I'm talking about. They'll watch Ryan's world or, um, hobby kids or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And then they'll post something, but then immediately underneath it, you go five comments down and there's some lunatic troll on there saying, I hope you kill yourself and your mom dies of, mm, you know, brain course. cancer yeah. or something like that. As you'd expect. Right. And I'm just saying, if my daughter ever had to read that comment and then came to me, I'd mm. be like, okay, well now I have a mission in life to find this person. Someone's going to die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, so if you want your dad around, honey, let's not do a YouTube channel. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's bottom line. Yeah. <laughs> It'll keep me in your life. Yeah. yeah. That's, you, you, uh, so this should be our last recording before, just to let everybody know, in case you're going to go into guerrilla social work withdrawals, this is going to be our last recording before the first of the year. We'll take a little bit of a break. We've been pretty frequent. The, I'm proud We're of us. We're doing way better. Yeah. yeah. I'm proud of us. So, and I've seen like the ratings and everything go up. So we really appreciate that for everybody who's doing that. Um, but this is, are you, are you, are you ready for, your, it. for yeah. your Christmas? Um, not really. Not yet. Now you still have stuff to buy? Yeah. And I only have one person to shop for. Oh. My wife does all the shopping for everybody else. Yeah. I heard about yeah. these blankets that we gave away this Dude, year. Yeah. Are they pretty nice? I never I've got one them. in my car for you if you want. Oh, yeah. They're well, the, the best blanket you'll ever come across. Well, I don't know about that. I have, no, no. They're... I have like 30 minky couture's in my house. So This is right up there. Okay. Neck, neck and neck with minky. Okay. And it's a Utah brand. Oh, really? Yeah. It starts with an S. No okay. It's called. Is and it... it has our embroidered logo on it. Oh, is that... Okay, that's it? Yeah. All right, well, I'll give it a look. I'll give it a whirl. I mean, yeah, I guess it couldn't couldn't hurt having one of those around. So I will unabashedly say that I like snuggling in it. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Speaking of uh so of the season, I figured we we cap this year off um talking about charity and stuff like that. So, um I don't know. When it so <laughs> I was I was listening to um, another podcast and, and there was an, an expert, I guess you could say on, um, kind of like rational decision-making. Um, so this is, is it, it's not David Pinker, it's Steven Pinker, right? Steven Pinker. Steven Pinker. And he has a new book out. I think it's called rationality. And he was talking about, um, this, this idea of kind of effective charity, which I was like, what are you talking? I've never even heard of that. Like charity is charity. Cause when I think about the Christmas season, for whatever reason, I get inspired to, to like give, give to charities and, and, or give back or whatever. And so like in the past, um, and I, I'm not, now listen, I'm not like trying to toot my own horn here. I'm just, and I'll tell you the reasons why I do this. Okay. Because they're not what you think. So, Hold your oh for somebody else because that's that's not what it is. Or um, they just think you're trying to bloviate and talk about how cool you are. Well, <laughs> see how much I give. <laughs> no, I, so I'm telling you that's not that's not it, right? right. So I feel like uh, this time of year draws my attention to, to the less fortunate. It's kind of like you pay attention to things that that are going on in, in your life and you want to give to like your, your members of your family, loved ones, so on and so forth. But then also it's like, yeah, but if you're, you know, doing relatively well and your family's taken care of you, I don't know, my attention goes towards people who are less fortunate and particularly like, you know, in the past I've had families who are just fine families, but financially they just don't have, you know, the means to be able to provide, you know, or whatever. So I was like, oh, okay, let, let's get together. So I, 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 one year I, I remember buying a bunch of presents for a family and bringing them over to their house. And this was, this was from a client who identified this family. I did not know them whatsoever and bought those things, you know, didn't get a tax write off or anything and, and did that. Now, of course that's wonderful, right? I never get a tax write off, nothing. 
And so, yeah, it helped out a family, but, but the primary reason for doing that was it just made me feel good, you know, made me feel good about what I was doing. It made me feel like, okay, if I'm like, have a lot of activities that are pushing me, you know, in a, in a, I don't know, like, let's say there's an afterlife and it's either up or down. I'm trying to get more in the up column than the down column, right? Yeah, yeah. A little more in column A. <laughs> and if there's a karma, okay, let's, you know, for current activities, eh, maybe do a little bit of good stuff. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, who knows? But I was just, I was just trying to, and, and ultimately, I like feeling good. So <clears throat> selfishly, I gave this family some gifts. That's all it was about. And I thought it was a really good lesson for my kids to learn. Okay. So Wait, all how, in. How did you come across them again, the family? Um, one of my clients that I was working with oh, had right. said, Hey, here's this family, uh, her, she got pregnant and her dude left, you know, hightailed it out of town oh. and she's bedridden because she's pregnant and there's two kids in the home right now. She can't work. You know, she's really, un- she didn't. And there was a, a charitable organization that she was going to try to get like a sub for Santa type thing, but there was, it was a government thing. So you had to have like paperwork in by a certain date and she missed the deadline. So she was really worried about what she was going to get for her kids. And my client was really upset about it. Crying was one of her really good friends. And then I was like, huh, okay, well no harm, no foul. I mean, this isn't a client of mine. This isn't anything. This is a family. Right. And so, you know, I made sure all the, all the stuff, all the goods got over there. Um, ha- had a Santa deliver them like a Santa. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And more importantly, like I was, my kids were wrapping the presents with me. It was really pulled a, them into it. Right, right, right. I thought this is why we're doing this. You know, this is why you did just a good lesson. So it was all selfish. Like it was all just because I wanted to feel better about this. So that's what I'm saying. Don't give me a ton of credit. It's not sure. me bloviating about how good of a person I am. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that that makes me wonder though. Like when you think about. Get like people who give to charity. Like, have you ever given to a charity? Yeah. Okay. So, why do you give to charity? Uh, I mean, I don't mean to just to kind of copycat what you're saying, but it it does feel good, you know. I mean the 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 type of charity I give to is usually based on either you know either a personal connection to it or someone will convince me that something's a good cause. Mm-hmm. Um, like I the the National Center for Shaken Baby Syndrome. Yeah. You know, I was I was a governing board member for a minute. Have they figured that out yet? Like uh, the, the pro or con? Yeah, yeah. to shake yeah, a baby yeah. or I, not to I, shake a baby. I think they've sided with not. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. yeah, research. I know it you know. was back in the day, it was like up in the air. Yeah, yeah. Good parenting tactic or way to ruin someone's life forever. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. To shake a baby or not to shake yeah, a baby. Yeah, to shake or not to shake. To be yeah. continued. <laughs> they, they've landed on not shake. Is okay. What, is what I'm okay. Yeah, and I, I, I feel I'm like that's valid. That. And so I was like, yeah, if, okay, if they're, if they're going to not shake, I'll donate. Yeah. <laughs> that almost rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but, but it was, I, I, being, a board member, I saw the financials. I know mm-hmm. where the money goes. It, it's a, that's a well-run organization. Mm-hmm. So, so in other words, like if, if you have a personal connection to it and you feel like your dollar is each dollar that you donate is going towards a good cause, you, you, you tend to feel better about it. That's right. You I feel don't more confident in your, in your donation. Uh, yes. I feel more confident in my donation. Okay. There's, there's plenty of horror stories out there about, different, you know, uh, charities that like it all goes towards administration and whatever the, the, re- the intended recipient is gets like a dime or mm-hmm. something, you know? Yeah. Well, I was, I mean, I mean, I was looking at ch- like uh nonprofits cause all charities are also nonprofits, right? Five. Yeah. Series, yeah. Kinda yeah have that sounds right. Okay. Um, and I was, I was looking at this because, you know, the other thing is you're also paying salaries of the people who work there. Right. So if this is a foundation or a charity that gets so bureaucratic and top heavy, well, the only money that goes to charity is after, you know, all the overhead is taken care of and all the people have been paid and everything then, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I kind of realized that along the way. So I was thinking, okay, well, um, now I was kind of lazy about it. I just thought, well, I don't know to be more effective. And I just was coming back to myself again. (laughs) I was like, okay. can I give to something that's going to at least give me a tax break? Right. And I know that sounds selfish, but look, here's what I'm, and it is, but here's the reason why 
um, if you if you ever get to the point where you're making enough money to have to pay taxes, you know, and I'm not talking about you go to Burger King and buy a Whopper and there's a tax associated with that. I'm talking about the end of the year that you know the you get your you get your return and you have to pay money to the government. Like that's a really hard check to write. Sure, you know is. what I mean. And I'd much rather say, okay, well, I'd rather give that to a charity rather than giving that to the government, right? And then they let you do that, right? Which is nice. I like doing that, right? That makes that makes more sense in my mind to at least get some of that going in that direction. It feels like you have a little more control over your dollar. Right. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm a, I'm a little skeptical that the government knows exactly what to do with my money, you know? <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, if, if, if I, I mean, once it goes into the government ether, you know, I it just, it's completely ambiguous. There's no way to track those dollars, regardless of if you believe the government's doing a good job or not. That's neither here nor there. The, the reality is I, whatever my dollars turn into, they just turn into decimal points, you know, along the way. And who knows where they go? Like if I donate to a charity, I know where the money went. Right. Right. And at least then I can have some confidence in this. So, so one thing I started to ask myself was after I was listening to this podcast was um, he, he mentioned, a word he said evidence based charity which now evidence based is a word or a phrase rather that you and I have have paid a whole lot of attention to right right and it got me thinking about well i guess there could be you know the best way to to donate to a charity and then i got thinking also about well what are the reasons why a lot of people donate to charity so if you had to if you had to guess like average bear you know average joe or what is it? is it John Q citizen? Is that what it is? John Q public. John Q public. Is that I right? know there's a movie for Denzel Washington called John Q and I That's right. And Citizen Kane. <laughs> okay. Uh Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah, okay. So Johnny Mnemonic yeah. uh <laughs> It's like great value matrix. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Western family matrix. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no offense, yeah. Western family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> give us a give us a sponsor. Um <laughs> we'll take anything. Uh, yeah. Um so I was thinking about like uh okay, what if you had to think about why Johnny Mnemonic, why he <laughs> <laughs> why he donates to charity. <laughs> okay, John Q. Yeah, Public. Yeah. Why just the average person donates to charity? I mean, really whether want- whether that's donating money or donating time or donating clothes or whatever it is. I mean, again, why, where do you think their motivation is? I guess expressed generally wanting to make a difference. Right, right. Or I want to get rid of some crap, right? And it better to go donate this than then just dump it in some, you know, oh, you weren't just talking, you're, you're talking about like, like clothes that no longer fits. Right. Well, yeah, that's to get rid all of all kinds of get, stuff. Get rid of stuff. Yeah. Have the win win of, I'm not throwing it in the trash. It's going somewhere good, but I don't have room in my closet. So, so in other words, there's some altruistic thoughts here going on. Yeah. Like in other, like I, it, it's, well, it's not, it is, but it's not. But what I'm saying is, so it made me start thinking about, um, a while back, we started talking about the differences between uh, cognitive empathy versus emotional empathy, right? Right. And empathy is is even to this day um, one of those subjects that come up quite a bit in the type of work that we do. So when you're working with offenders in the criminal justice system, sex offenders or otherwise, um, empathy is a big concept, and it's it's unfortunately for a lot of proponents of empathy been proven time and time again that it is not an effective measure of the likelihood of recidivism. In other words, somebody with low levels of empathy is not necessarily more likely to offend than somebody with really high levels of empathy. And part of the reason why I think that is, and I think we've talked about this on a on a previous podcast, was there's a difference between empathy and compassion. And do you remember kind of how we define those differently? Um, compassion is what empathy in action. Yeah. Like it's an extension of empathy. Like compassion is an actionable something, right? It's, it's leading me to take action and and doing something. And the idea would be, you know, I, I see another person suffering. And so I attempt to alleviate that, or I look at my own behaviors and I know that whatever I'm about to do is going to hurt that person and out of compassion, I don't act on that or I don't, or at very least I just break even and don't add to their problems. Right. I just kind of keep walking or whatever. Okay. So 
but empathy by itself is just a, a, a frame of reference that we have in our own minds, like in terms of our connection with other people. So empathy is great for connecting us to other people, but it's, it's the value of that connection and what happens next that really kind of defines what's going to happen with that person. Because one of the things we've talked about before was, you know, emotional empathy sometimes is very difficult for people, but cognitive empathy, right. Which is kind of more, um, I, I'm, I'm able to imagine and understand where another person is coming from, right? So, so like just to kind of narrow down those definitions between cognitive empathy and emotional empathy, mm-hmm. like cognitive empathy would be, I, I see, you know, a homeless person on the, you know, at the, at the, the on ramp on the freeway uh, with his uh, cardboard sign. And I think to myself, like that guy must be feeling like, helpless and uh like down and out and at a loss and he's maybe feeling a little maybe perhaps ashamed that he's having to do this and but things must be tough enough that he he's he's still coming out here despite his shame and asking for uh, assistance and that so that would be cognitive empathy right i'm just understanding right this guy might be feeling this yeah 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 and i i mean i was pulling up some things here like so taking another person's perspective, imagining what it's like to be in the other person's shoes and, and, and based on their personal history and their thoughts, and then understanding someone's feelings. That's it, right? Yeah. And one of the things we discussed was that can actually be very dangerous because if you have – if the, the guy who's using cognitive empathy is Ted Bundy, well, what happens after that is you know a lot of taking advantage of and manipulation – all for the purposes of obviously very bad, very dark outcomes, right? Like if I understand the this homeless guy's feelings of desperation and I have ill will, I could manipulate him into doing something messed up to somebody else for money or something. Right. Kind of like, like bum fights. You right. Know? Like, yeah, good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bum fights is a good example of yeah. cognitive empathy. Right. They, they, yeah. they manipulated these poor down and out dudes that, I mean, should just have been left alone, you know, and got them to do some pretty wacky stuff and put them on a, t- you know, thing and, and then off we go. So yeah, exploitation. If, right. Yeah. Right. So I can, so cognitive empathy. Now, cognitive empathy is incredibly useful. It's not only just dark stuff. So even with our clients, one of the things we've talked about is that this is helpful when dealing with, say, another a difficult person. So a lot of our clients are involved in the justice system, one form or another. A lot of them have probation officers and parole officers. And at times they disagree with their probation or parole officer, or even the therapist for that matter, right? And I mean, I don't know, any number of names they've thrown out there. You know, he's a dick, he's an asshole, he's a piece of shit, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you cognitive empathy doesn't, you know, we're saying, well, have some empathy for that guy. And the idea there is, is like, Almost like, well, why don't you, people I think here, you should have compassion for that guy. None of our clients want to hear that. They don't want to hear, well, I, I should have compassion for this asshole. You know, treats me like crap or whatever. And that's their perspective. Not necessarily what's happening, but that's kind of their perspective. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm trying to say is, is why don't you try to imagine what's going through his head and what his circumstances are as to why he's treating you that way. And the reason why that's beneficial to you is it helps you know how to respond to him than, or her the next time you talk to them, you know, in, in the next setting and kind of how you're going to frame this. And is that manipulating? Well, yeah, of course it is. Right. But it's not for bad outcomes. It's for positive outcomes. I'm trying to have a workable relationship. We should do this with our bosses, our loved ones, everything. So cognitive empathy is also very helpful. Emotional empathy, on the other hand, this is where I think we start to get into charities and why we why some people donate to charities. Because emotional empathy is kind of more like sharing an emotional experience or feeling distress in response mm. to someone's pain or experiencing willingness to help someone, right? So kind of the the um the example yeah. that it gives here is is like um you know, like, remember the last time you were with a loved one who was feeling sad or hopeless? Maybe it was after a divorce or after they received a life-altering diagnosis or after a loss of a close loved one. Their tears created a response within us. We felt moved to want to comfort them somehow. That's emotional empathy. I'm being present with Just you. Just dealt with that. Right. Yeah. I'm being present with you and your emotions at this point, and I am also vicariously experiencing those as well, right? So... That sometimes is, I think you, you know, um, 
why <laughs> I might, let's talk about maybe the least effective way of giving charity. I'm coming off the, off the off ramp of the freeway. And I see that dude at the end of the freeway who has a sign that says, God knows what, you know, and somebody gives him a dollar, right? Well, the, the reason why is I feel a little bit of emotional empathy towards that person. It's not cognitive empathy. It's emotional empathy because yeah. can we all agree where that money's probably going? Uh, yeah. Where I mean, where's it going? Uh, into a bottle. Or into a needle, yeah. or so, right? Or something yep. like that. I mean, we can... I understand it says veteran and all this other jazz, okay? But the likelihood of that money being put into a new business suit so this guy can go get an interview and invent the cure for cancer is slim to none, okay? If it is, then that's amazing. But I'm just saying probably not. So the reason is, well, why do we do it? Even though deep down I think we all know that's probably not a dollar well spent. It pleases the conscience. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we feel an emotional sting as a result of seeing that person in unfortunate circumstances and to relieve that sting, you know, it's like a $2 fee. Here you go. Here's your fee. Now I feel better. Dude, the, the wife and I were at Vasa getting a workout in and there was a homeless dude in the parking lot and I, I got a little irritated, but he had, he had his kid with him oh, out there with holding the sign. The worst. I, uh, yeah. And that, if, his kid was holding the sign. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. He was, ha- yeah. He was having his kid help him hold the sign. It felt, it felt a little manipulative. Oh, well, his, a little. Know? Yeah. You know, but that, that works on right. people that don't think through like, wow, this guy is exploiting his kid. Right. You know? Right. And, well, no, yeah, but it, th- it works though. See, that would be, that's the rub of cognitive empathy. I mean, if I if I truly tried to understand what the guy was thinking and feeling, it would be well. If I get my kid out here and have him hold the sun, I'll probably get a few extra bucks. From right? Him. You know what I mean? Yep. Like that's that's which is really when it boils down to it's kind of shitty. Yeah. Then, and then when you think about where those dollars went, again, it's even it makes you even almost feel worse if you really try to think about it. So yeah. what I'm saying is, um, and I'm not. This is not an appeal to say don't. <laughs> give money to homeless people. I mean, I don't recommend it for a variety of reasons. And anybody who knows anything about like, um, homeless folks, uh, you know, I don't know. Is it homeless advocate? What? Like people who know like what to do with money for helping the homeless. Never heard the term. Never heard of homeless advocate. No. Oh, okay. I was always like (laughs) advocate. I mean, like, I don't know if that makes you necessarily like an expert in how to alleviate homelessness. Cause like Just I can be an advocate. Well, yeah, I'm an advocate for certain. I mean, I mean these guys need help. Yeah. Like, like what, what though? Well, yeah. 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 Like I'm an, I'm an advocate for like my kid, but that doesn't mean I, I'm an expert in children by any stretch. Right. You know what I mean? Sure. So yep. I don't know, but I think I've heard before that obviously giving money to the homeless shelters and them being able to use that to provide the services that are actually, and I do know this, like that when they go to local shelters here, they'll get a case manager assigned to them. They'll get an ID as long as they're following the rules, which is mostly why people drop out of those places Yeah, that they'll get them on their feet. They can stay there. They can reestablish themselves. And I've seen people be successful, but a lot of people don't like following the rules. So, so then I was thinking, okay, well, how do we get past this then? Like, how do we, how do we, bypass this emotional empathy and use more cognitive empathy in terms of, of our charitable experience. Like if, if you're in the, in the business of this, right? So this is the evidence-based, right? What'd you call it? it uh, evidence based, yeah, evidence-based charity, charity was the whole thing. So I was looking up and this was kind of, this was what was kind of cool. So I looked up a, and this was from, um, the sources, uh, fidelity charitable. Uh, and this was talking about, statistics on what people are trying to do. So I thought we'd kind of look look at this really quick and see kind of where people stand on a few of these things. So it says here, charitable giving is a deeply entrenched holiday tradition for two-thirds of Americans. They are planning a variety of philanthrop- philanthropic activities in 2021. Um, so the question was, did you participate in charitable activities at year-end? 64% said, yes, I participate. 36% says, no, I usually don't give, um, don't, I give it other times. So the good news is, is again, I think the holidays are kind of a time that motivate people to do this. Right. And at least two thirds of our, of our country 
do it, at least according to them, right? What was cool here was it kind of broke this down. So it says, uh, which ways do you plan to be charitable this year? So 53% of those responses said give money to charities. 46% said donate goods to charities. This could, you know, be, I, I assume, clothing, food. There's canned food drives or whatever. Um, 27% donate money, goods directly to individuals, families in need. So, so that was kind of what I did. Uh, perform random acts of kindness. Again, you walk an old lady across the street. Why she always got to be old? <laughs> I feel like old ladies can do it. <laughs> volunteer. <laughs> they got it. <laughs> yeah. Volunteer, like going to the soup kitchen, I imagine, or, or anything else. Uh, participate in charitable activities through a faith-based organization. Uh, participate in charitable experience with a family. Purchase gifts from charities or socially responsible businesses. So that's kind of the 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 so, – so, I mean, are you – now, now that you know you, you're thinking about this, are you planning on doing any of those this year, or have you already done the, those this year? Yeah. The well, what's the one that would be like helping out a family? That's donate oh, yeah, money or that, goods directly to individuals or families in need. Yeah, that's the one that we're we're doing. Okay. So good. Yeah. And and this is so the other thing was kind of talking about like a couple of tips on this was, you know, search for a match. Like you said, if, so if you can find something that you're beholden to, then usually it might, uh, they said, start with your employment. Cause usually your employment, if you're into a career is something that you're, I mean, hopefully passionate about. And sometimes employers will match your donation. Uh, and that, that would be mm. really, that would be, I don't know if your employer, since yeah. you're self-employed yeah. is doing that. Yeah. They're all, uh, no. Yeah, not, no, nah, no. Nope. Uh, the other thing this was saying was um, most Americans, this is, uh, most Americans are planning to delay their action on charitable plans um, after holiday shopping. So this was saying, you know, which do you expect to finish this year, charitable giving or holiday shopping? 60% of Americans said, they're going to finish their shopping, which kind of makes sense. I think, you know, like you're, you got to, it's always a burden. You get that out of the way and then, you know, find out what you have left and then give the rest over. Yeah. I think that's just being prudent with how you're wanting to spend your money. Right. So this is, this is obviously giving you some tips here. Don't hesitate. Donation must be given by December 31st for income tax uh, deduction uh, and consider a donor advised fund. So there's, I thought some, some good, I'll put a link to this in the show notes, by the way. And I thought there were some good links to this. Um, but, and then I started kind of looking at, um, okay, well, how can I, how can I make sure what you were talking about was, what well, what's the best, absolute best way to know where my dollars are being spent, right? Because if you're going to be helping out a family, right? Um, here's my, my here's my dark side of me. So, like, can you can you see that going wrong at all? Of course. Okay, how? Uh, that they would blow it on something else. Maybe they're not in as much need as they're presenting to be in. Um, yeah, they 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 yeah, like I said, they spend it on something that isn't going to help their kids. I mean, right. Yeah. So you're just giving straight cash money to a family. Yeah. Okay. And then letting them, it, well, it's, uh, <clears throat> the wife set it up. It's there. There's a, there's actually a shopping list. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And are you going to go buy the things or, yeah. okay. Okay. Uh-huh. So that that's, that's similar to what I did. I mean, I didn't get a shopping list. I, the, the friend told me basically here's some good things and I thought it was all good things. But they were all, of course, wrapped and everything. I was like, well, I mean, they could just take this and go sell it and then go buy drugs. Right, right. Or, or yeah. bring it back to – or try to bring it back to Walmart or something. And I've had all those thoughts. Right, and do all those things, right? So it feels like – when I did that, I was like, yeah, I'm giving to this. But I also – so I know exactly where the money's going and I have an idea that it's going to be good, right? You're banking on – Simply just another person, the recipient's moral conscience. Right, right. But again, I'm like, okay, am I using some emotional empathy or cognitive empathy in my decision making? Probably emotional. Probably emotional. So then I was asking myself, well, is there a way to to ask ourselves where this evidence based charity was? Is there a way to make sure that we're given getting the most bang for our buck? And and unfortunately, it brought me down this rabbit hole that. 
is very much like evidence-based treatment. So one of the things that we talk about with evidence-based treatment, well, we'll do a quiz here. So when you took your training from, uh, you know, uh, the great Jamie Newsom, yeah. um, Eric Willoughby, uh, what do you remember about evidence-based versus anecdotal evidence? Like uh, empirical evidence versus anecdotal evidence. In terms of which is more effective or? What In terms of how like it was described. Oh, um, well, I don't remember how they specifically put it, but anecdotal evidence is like, I know a guy or in my experience, this, this, and this has happened. Evidence based is where you're, you're taking I, ideally, um, an, an objective analysis of, of what type of treatment works. Right. So in, in, in a real quick summary, basically the way that they put it was anecdotal evidence, um, doesn't really move the needle in terms of making changes in our clients' lives, right? But it makes us feel good. So the reference that I always have was I, I worked with a judge who used to um, send – It was this was a drug court judge, and the, the drug court was always sending clients to jail all the time. That was the, the solution to everything. I mean if you – if you have a tamper on your UA or you miss a UA or, or anything goes wrong, jail immediately, right? And the reason why, and this judge had cited it multiple times, was the judge said, I had, a, I had a girl who went to jail and she said that was the best experience for her. And that was the thing that she needed to get her butt in gear. And that, so I was like, okay, so one client set the policy for this entire drug court. In, in other words, it, like when she said that to the judge, it resonated with the judge. The judge felt really good about the decision to send her to jail. He felt like, wow, I, this woman, I really made an impact in her life by giving her that tough love or whatever it is. And then use that emotional reasoning and extrapolated and applied it to a bunch of people. Yes. Except for the judge was a female, you sexist pig. <laughs> <laughs> Aside Damn from it. that. Yeah. yeah. So now, now, now look, net effect of that, what we were noticing was, um, and I, if any of you work in the field of substance use and your UAs, your, uh, your analysis, if they measure uh, creatinine levels for whatever reason, um, and this is semi anecdotal, but there's plenty of evidence to support this too. Uh, well, I don't have the statistics handy, but at least at this one agency, females had a really hard time producing what it, what they like a non diluted sample. And it wasn't a matter of that they were drinking tons of water. It was a matter of their creatinine levels did not measure up to a, a certain level, right? And and really creatinine's a byproduct of protein synthesis to the kidneys, not to get all crazy about it. But basically it's a way of the the toxicologist measuring if there's any, you know, screwery on the other end of them trying to mess with it, right? And yes, drinking massive amounts of water will do that. But also if your protein intake is really low, that'll do that too, right? And what was fascinating about this was um, so they'd go to jail for like a day or two, but here's the deal. These girls had really poor diets. They weren't getting enough exercise, you know, just eating gobs and gobs of protein. Um, and then, and then oddly enough, we had gotten some expert feedback on some of this stuff and they're like, yeah, well, the best way to avoid dilutes is just to hold it. And I was like, but then they said, but the byproduct of that is you lead to a lot of urinary tract infections and then that leads to dilute samples. So I was like, okay, all right. And, um, and the girls would go to jail for two days at a time. But if you think we know a lot about jail, think about you go in there, you get booked. How long are you in booking? And then you sit there, whatever happens, you're off your meds for however long. And then how many meals are you getting in that time period? You know, that are high quality meals, probably not a lot of, you know, it's we not, try to it's get not a good two days. Right. And then you come out and then you have to, depending on your animization, you have to submit a sample the day you get out. Then that's dilute too. How could they have any control over that while they're in jail? And of course, the answer is, well, there's drugs in jail. And I'm like, come on, come on, folks. Can we just – and my my appeal to this was, can we use more than one metric of determining whether or not this person has used? Can we use behavioral observations, self-report, collateral information, you know, other sources that that kind of contribute to this? So – that's kind of the burden of, or I guess the harm of anecdotal evidence, whereas empirical evidence isn't super sexy. It doesn't make us feel good and it's overall kind of boring. And honestly, that's kind of what I found out with the, with these charities. Cause when you think about what this has said forever was just do cognitive behavioral therapy. That's all they've ever said, you know, since the eighties, 
just do cognitive behavioral mm-hmm. therapy, which people go, oh, my so boring. It's like, yeah, but it's the best thing we got. And here's all the, here's the mountain of evidence to prove that. But people don't like that. They like, well, I have a client that got a horse to lift its hoof and uh, <laughs> she got way better. So yeah. Yeah. And so equestrian therapy is the way yeah. nothing against equestrian therapy, but um, fortunately there was a, uh, there's some science behind this and this was from Harvard university, which it seems to me, doesn't get much better than that last time I checked. <laughs> yeah, they're all right. So the name of the article was What Gives the Science Behind Effective Charitable Giving? And basically they were kind of recognizing that December is is a time that people are are giving to charities and whatnot. And that um, you know, fundraising fundraising is a thing that that is appealing to people. And so the the question is, is kind of what we're getting down to is is there an actual way to choose the right or the best charity? to give your time and or money to, right? Or donations to, okay? And um, they have a, they named this as a social movement called Effective Altruism. And there's a TED Talk I'll link to also that you guys can watch, which is pretty fascinating. Um, and really this is this is the idea of helping people be more informed about their charitable donations. Because on, on an anecdotal level, the the contributions that we made to families, that that we can see that in real time as to whether or not that, you know, we know on Christmas day, that was probably awesome. I mean, we weren't there opening the presents with them, you know? Um, but, but it's like, to what degree did our money get maximized in true effective change? Right. So I think, I think <clears throat> on a, on an anecdotal level, we feel good. And we, and if provided that they didn't sell the toys for drugs, we made a positive impact on that family anecdotally okay did it move the needle in terms of charitable don- well i mean this is this kind of tells us this so um they basically say there's three things you want to look at so one is similar to what we were talking about earlier so important steps there's three steps finding a cause with the potential to make the most impact number two identifying the most effective solution and number three quantify three Three, quantifying the desired impact. So that, that first sentence is interesting. Identifying the right cause can mm-hmm. be more important than selecting the right charity. Yeah. I, so like, I like that. Let's yeah. take a look at this. Identifying the right cause can be more important than selecting the right charity. Charitable donations can range from global health issues such as vaccine deployment or end-of-life care. And this is like vaccines, not COVID-19 vaccines. To economic development such as supporting entrepreneurs in developing nations to societal concerns such as criminal justice reform. Some of the key features used by effective altruists to select worthy causes include scale of problem, how neglected it is, and how likely it is to be solved. So they kind of give you a little thing. Yeah. So the scale of the problem, pretty easy. Scale of the problem refers to both the number of individuals affected by it and how deeply they are impacted by the problem. And the example that they give here is they they say, okay, so if you had two – um, if you just looked at sheer numbers, right, and you were looking at the, um, the 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 effectiveness of donating to a charity for people who are blind, okay, so you know, looking to, uh, charities aimed towards curing blindness or HIV, okay, um, they said according to the World Health Organization, appro- approximately 36 million individuals are blind, and 36.7 million individuals are living with HIV. So if you just look at the numbers right there, I mean, donating to either one of those seems like it's, it's a, a worthy up. cause, right? Yeah, and it's, yeah, so, e- equal amounts, huh? Right. So they said, through extensive studies and surveys, afflicted inv- individuals, uh, the WHO determined, the World Health Organization determined that people living with untreated HIV exhibit a disease burden that is approximately 1.5 times higher than those living with blindness. In other words, the burden of the disease of HIV is much greater than that of blindness. Cause I mean, I don't know. Have you seen that? Have you seen that show on Apple plus called uh, C? No. Oh bro. I'm telling you what, like I n- never used to be a big fan of Jason Momoa. You know, I saw him in game of Thrones. Yeah. He's cool. He was in there for like five minutes and then he's Aquaman. He's cool. You know, whatever. Then I saw him in this show and I was like, I love that guy, dude. Like I can't get enough of Jason Momoa now. Like he is. It's called C. Yeah. It's kind of this uh, post-apocalyptic dystopia where everybody's blind. There's some disease and everybody's blind. Oh, okay. And then there's like five people that can see in the, they call them sighted, you know, and there's five people that can see in the world. But the funny thing is, is like 
the blind people are way more functional than the than the sighted people. Huh. Sighted people take their you know sight for granted, and the blind people are dude. They're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So I was like, oh, you know, once you adapt to it, you know, human beings are pretty resilient and very adaptable. That's a unique plot, dude. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. It's and it's so good. It's so good. Huh. Yeah. It's uh yeah. If you haven't got, the, I I highly suggest. I've never it. heard that plot. So good. That's cool. Yeah. And it was um anyway, but the idea here is um basically that if you're looking at scalability, you know, you're going to have a much bigger impact because I don't know, I've, I've, I've worked with blind people before and you know, they, they get around grant. <laughs> yeah. They do. Okay. Yeah. That's what I want to say. I, I am amazed about how functional it is because if I thought that I lost my vision, like if you took all my senses away, I would trade all of my other senses just to keep my vision. Dude, we're so oriented towards processing a world through our eyes. Right. It, it is kind of crazy how like people that have been blind for a long time just can live a pretty damn normal life. Right. But without the, uh, so, so the thing is, is blindness. And, and if you think about that, like um, blindness is one of those things that, seemingly is e- easier to adapt to than HIV given a certain g- given some certain quality. So for example, if I'm just blind, right? And there's no corresponding side effects or after effects of that aside from that I need to learn how to to adapt to and operate within this world without vision. Well, I'm going to, I don't know if that whole thing is true that you turn into a superhero with your hearing and smell or whatever. That's what you hear though. Huh? I, I would imagine yeah. That you focus more on the, using right. those senses than your eyes because you don't have your eyes, right? You're just more tuned into it. Correct. Yeah. And people count steps. I mean, sh- dude, you ever seen Daredevil? Shit, that dude's doing flips. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying. Now, the, the problem with it is is that HIV requires more than that. It requires more than just your adaptability because going untreated with medi- like medicinal intervention, can I adapt to HIV? Long term, I cannot. Well, yeah. I'm just going to, you know, I don't know where the full-blown AIDS comes along or whatever, yeah. but eventually it's going to get there, and then I just croak. You know what I mean? And it's a horrible death. So say Philadelphia when I watched it, yeah, yeah. you know, 20 years ago. Rent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a musical? Yeah. And you watched it? Yeah. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Yeah, I got I got pulled into it. Yeah? yeah? Did you watch the actual musical or the movie? The movie. Okay, okay. Well, yeah. Good enough, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I guess what I'm saying is is that – I hate musicals. Yeah, so I would have to imagine that the HIV problem, you're, you're donating to medicinal you know, intervention in, in other nations that need that, right? Because if you get an HIV in America, I think you're set. Like you're fine. You know what I mean? The, you can go to places. There's going to be some sort of – HIV in 2021's uh, – no, not what it was in 1982. Right, right. Yeah. Unless you're in a country that doesn't have the the infrastructure to take care of it. There you go. Where, where as a charity, you're going to do much better off. So the idea there is just that, yeah, numbers are equal, but in terms of the scalability, you're you're going to do much better um, in terms of donating for the HIV. Right. Yeah. Whereas you're just looking at sheer numbers, you're going to run into some problems there. Okay, it goes on. So neglectedness. Neglectedness is a measure of how many resources are currently devoted to a particular cause. Ideally, you want to identify a cause that is not already crowded by other philanthropists or foundations because of focusing on a neglected but still large-scale problem means your donations will be more impactful. Donating a million dollars to a cause that only receives approximately 200000 annually will have a bigger influence than donating to a cause that regularly receives $100 million annually. That one makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So yeah. If, the, if the if the if the cause is already like, I mean, if it's supported by Bill Gates, butt out. You, yeah. you don't need to be there. He's got yeah. it. You know what I mean? Like you, they don't need your money at that point. Yeah, you'll drop in the bucket. Yeah. So it, in in this example, they're saying that an effective altruist would consider disaster relief funding as an unwise investment because this cause already receives a large scale influx of donations. They would instead focus on a cause that receives little attention, which is the field of artificial intelligence, which is viewed by many as a catastrophic threat to humanity. Yet there are a few resources and organizations devoted to its control. Yeah, I saw a Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I got a shirt on the way. That says Skynet Industries. Oh, badass. Oh yeah. I found this. That's where this is from right here. You know where the, what movie this is from? <laughs> no. 
from Better Off Dead. Oh, with, no, yeah. nice. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, I have, I have, yeah, two shirts. One says Bodie for president. That was That's awesome. Patrick Swayze's best movie. Is that the bad guy? No, no, no. This is the, the good guy. Okay. He's yeah. His it says right here though. Uh, oh, defeated Roy Stone. What's I love his last name is Stalin. Yeah, yeah. He was in Automatic. The 80s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little on the nose. Yeah, making it's a bad from guy. this. Uh, uh, gosh, I I can't think of the. I'll, I'll remember the the website, but it's got a bunch of cool. That's the one that I have. Skynet that, Industries, though. Yeah. Well, I, I have another yeah. one that I I uh, says. Uh, Buddy Ravel's Brass Knuckle That's Company. right, yeah. Dude, uh-huh. I love that shirt. And I was like, I saw all these shirts, and I'm like, dude, I love those movies. <laughs> yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to figure out what that's from. But anyway, um, yeah, y- you would think if if it's a huge threat to humanity, my hope would be, like, dudes like, um, uh, who's that really smart guy that you really like? Sam Harris. Sam Harris. He's donating to a charity that is focused on controlling AI. <laughs> That would be 100% something that he would donate to. Right. Yeah. And he seems pretty intellectual about all of his decisions, yeah. right? So if he's going to be an altruistic like donator then the, or an effective altruistic, then he that's what he would be donating that's to. That's right. So the third thing that they reference here is solvability. When identifying the best cause, its solvability must be considered. This is perhaps one of the most important criteria because even if a cause is large scale and neglected, it may not be worth donating to if there aren't any clear or immediate solutions. The best causes are those that can be solved with an evidence-based intervention. A classic example of solvability is the prevention of malaria transmission in sub-Saharan Africa through the distribution of long-lasting insecticide-threaded bed nets. Through a series of small and large-scale randomized control trials, researchers established that the distribution and usage of these bed nets significantly decreased childhood mortality and other health outcomes related to malaria contraction. Distributing bed nets to prevent malaria transmission via the Against Malaria Foundation is an intervention that is large-scale, neglected, room for more funding, and solvable. So... But how sexy is that during the di- this, during the holiday season? This you, is the bed nets for African <laughs> malaria. This is a, this is a perfect example of what you're talking about because of its lack of sexiness of it. It doesn't have that feel good thing to it. But I mean, malaria has killed more people than anything, right? You know, and right. and money, you know, hundred bucks. I don't know how many bed nets hundred bucks buys, but it's gonna be substantially more impactful than a lot a lot of uh the feel good charities well well and i mean i don't feel like shit about it but i i do have a little bit of regret in terms of like my money could have i i would have gotten a my tax deduction you know again there's a benefit if you're given money but but also i know my dollars would have been better spent even if it was 10 bucks towards these bed nets yeah you know what i mean like and but i mean that's the whole thing how how is it that you can wrap your mind around that that that's the best i mean who would have thought about that well, during the holiday yeah, season right who would have thought bed nets malaria oh yeah of course you know what i mean but i mean i don't know christmas has happened in africa to africa too i imagine yeah. you know and for some of those i mean getting a bed net might be the best christmas present of all i'm not saying I, it, it absolutely would <laughs> that's be. what's gonna happen oh christmas morning, christmas bed net. <laughs> I'm not saying that's what happens, yeah. but yeah. I don't know if that's how it goes, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just. So so this goes back to a lot of what when we were doing this was um you know when they said, Okay, well how do we how do we get the data for the type of treatment how do we know cognitive behavioral therapy is the best? And what they referenced in, in our last podcast when we were doing this with with Jamie and Eric was through Meta analyses, study yeah. of studies over time, over time. And these are, you know, randomized control trials, right? So then again, in the Harvard article, not not some blog post from some nut, um, identifying the most effective solution. After identifying the right cause, the next step for an effective altruist is to determine the most effective solution. The gold standard for deciding on the most effective solution is to conduct a randomized control trial. So that's what everybody needs to do listening to this. To conduct a randomized so control trial. That's the trial. end of the podcast. That's folks. the uh, <laughs> start your studying. Don't yeah. worry, we have an answer for this. So, if the cause you are most interested in is improving educational achievement in the developing world, there are several charities that apply different solutions you can consider for your donations. Goes on and on and on. But the idea here being that that essentially um, you need to ask yourself, okay. What are the, what are the, you know, 
I look at evidence. They kind of give some interventions here. Do I just give to the schools? Do I give to the teachers, textbooks, supplies, school uniforms? We have a pre-intervention, meaning we get a baseline. We give the the donation. We do a post-intervention. So essentially we have a control group, an experimental group. And then we ask ourselves, based on the data, which is the most effective. Mm. Okay, that that's essentially what it is. Now, <laughs> the the problem with this is, I mean, well, so, well, there's an obvious problem. What's what's the problem with with everybody conducting their own analysis? <laughs> right, like, right. Like, interest, uh-huh. know how, ability, capability, uh, desire. Like, and, like, no one, no one's doing that. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, our our our, uh, you know, we were we were fortunate enough to get a grant for a lot of the treatment services that we're doing. And let me tell you, it is not cheap. Right. And getting oh, money. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that too. <laughs> first of all, I don't even, yeah. when I think about putting numbers into anything, you know, what, uh, I mean, <laughs> I can't even put numbers into a phone half the time, but I'm saying like putting it into a spreadsheet or a database and then pressing like, you know, uh, whatever analyze or whatever it is. Yeah, like yeah. I, I can't even fathom like doing that. You know what I mean? Long, long term. Now other people dig it and they love it and, and it's, and it's great. And, but those people, you know, who's going to do that for a charity, you know, aside from, you know, people who are really invested in this. And and the good news is, or even who knows how, how many people have that skill? Like, yeah. How would you even know how to do this? Like I, part of the grant is that we partner with somebody who does know. Yeah, so I people. don't have to try to le- learn how to do this. So I just do interventions. I'm good working with clients. That's, that's what I do best. I don't put you in front of clients, right. let you do your thing. Right. Other people, the smart people point you right. and t- show you what to do. Yes. Yes. And th- and then they take what I do and, and tell me if I suck or not. Right. right? Long term. Yeah. And so th- this idea of quantifying the principle, this is kind of the final principle is, is essentially what, what we've been alluding to is did did you figure this out over time so the conclusion of all this is that um you know if you want to figure out the best way you know like the most bang for dude is that what it is listen to this effective altruism mo- movement aims to get the most bank for each buck is it bank? no it's bang you sure yeah is it one of those things look, do you remember I, look, those look, things i do know the things uh that we were totally wrong on? I'm 98% sure it's bang for your buck. Maybe they're just being clever. It is Harvard, after all. They're way smarter than us, man. We just missed a joke. They, that's some that's some intellectual jokes. Like, with a little, we'll throw a little pun in there. Oh, bank dude. Can, for your yeah. buck. <laughs> yeah, some dude. Uh, can you imagine all the Harvard nerds what reading that dork. part? And I'm <laughs> 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 Nerd! Yeah, with yeah. their, what are those things? <laughs> The what what are the 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 is you glasses but you only have one a monocle a monocle yeah. and their pocket squares <laughs> yeah. and the yeah <laughs> I don't know why their lips have to move when they laugh like that. <laughs> okay uh, I'm gonna say bang for your buck donate it to maximum maximize impact uh, with this mindset it becomes clear that certain causes should be prior- prioritized over others. While this perspective may not fit well with the traditional of spirit of giving, it has been gaining traction in recent years. Which, dude, it is that is so. Like I think about that, that is so true. Like if you think about uh, it, this is this is cool of for me to look at and say, you know, when we've seen all these these ideas of therapy and when they're talking about doing, you know whatever intervention it is and everybody's kind of have their flavor of the month intervention, just hardcore CBT is the order of the day. And it kind of, and here's our statistics and here's why your stuff doesn't work. And we have the evidence to show that your stuff doesn't work. It was really deflating for some people. Yeah. Whereas if you have a growth mindset about these things where you're kind of enthusiastic to learn, which I, I think I am, it, this to me has motivated me in another direction to say, well, yeah, there is a such thing as evidence-based charity giving and they have done randomized control trials. So the good news for us is we don't have to do randomized control trials. They've already done these for us. So here's the, here's the solution that they gave to us. So there is a, um, an organization called give well, and let me navigate us to their page. 
It's a it's a dot org like that. Uh, oh yeah, racial slur database. So you know <laughs> you know it's legit at that point. <laughs> yeah. Our top charities donate to high impact, cost effective charities backed by evidence and analysis. That is a line that doesn't get any better. Right. You donate to high impact, yeah. cost effective charities backed by evidence and analysis. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Treatment that is that gives high impact, cost effective interventions backed by evidence. And that's analysis. what you want. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly that what you want sense. for your clients. This is what you want for your dollar spent. So they've given their, their top 10 charities and wouldn't you know it. Uh, so number one, medicine to prevent malaria. <laughs> so still kills over 400,000 people annually. And look at this. About seven dollars to protect your child from malaria seven so hundred bucks and that that you're you're protecting multiple kids you're right what is it, like 12 kids right right exceptionally strong evidence many high quality studies of seasonal malaria chemo prevention have consistently found strong impact okay here's the links uh nets to prevent malaria there it is again about five dollars to prevent provide one net if i give a hundred dollars i've now provided 20 nets think about that dude that's 20 lives. Right. That's So in 2020, we directed funding against Malaria Foundation to support this program at an estimated average cost of 4500 per life saved. So, like, dude, that is... Dude, malaria kills over 400,000 people annually, yeah. mostly children. So you're Under you're, five. Yeah, you're, you're saving little kids' lives. Right. That's Nets save lives. Pretty good cause right. for Christmas. <laughs> Supplements to prevent vitamin A deficiency. About one dollar to deliver a vitamin A supplement. Okay, <laughs> to, we directed funding to Helen Keller International to support this program at an estimated average cost effectiveness of three thousand dollars per life saved. I didn't know vitamin A was something that was. Uh, yeah. Why would you yeah, know? I know, right? Yeah. Uh, cash incentive for routine childhood vaccines about hundred. Uh, so this says. 43 in Nigeria, 43% of infants did not receive all recommended childhood vaccines in 2019. Uh, so again, this is not COVID-19 vaccine. So if yeah. you don't want to donate towards that, I understand, but this is not that, uh, cost effectiveness about $142 to vaccinate an infant for everything in 2020, we directed funds to new incentives to support this program at an estimated average cost of $4,500 per life saved. Look at that. So for I mean they are getting all these things together, you know overall distribution of everything. This Treat makes me so much more likely to donate right. anyway. Treatments for parasitic worm infections. Um, this charity is five through eight, so they have uh, four four different charities here. Uh, CSI Foundation. Um, yeah. Anyway, you guys can see this, but so hundreds of millions of people around the world are infected with parasitic worms. Good Lord. This provides children with medication that clears parasitic infection may lead to a large increase in lifetime earnings. About $1 to deworm a child. $1 to deworm a child. That is a weird sentence. Right. About $1 to deworm a child. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not meaning to laugh. It's just a weird sentence. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. cash transfers for extreme poverty. Uh, the majority of people in the world live on less than $3,700 per year. Holy wow. cow. Can you believe that? This program gives cash to very poor families, mostly in Africa to spend as they like. So this is giving to families who need, who, <laughs> who don't make $3,700 a year, right? Um, program participants receive $83 out of every $100 don donated. That's really high, actually. And then the last one is is their GiveWell's Maximum Impact Fund, which look at this. That's pretty cool, that one. You give month, you give once $50, $100, or any other amount. You donate. There's no fee, um, and it, it's kind of distributed to whatever their, their most effective thing is at that time. So, so is someone – like they're deciding, like, okay, here's here's the best way to allocate mm -hmm. the money. This is this is the best fit for donors who want to maximize their impact. We take zero fees and use most up to date research to grant your gift where we believe it will help the most. Zero fees. We typically grant this pool of funds to one or more of our recommended charities each quarter. So one of those. Once we grant our donation, we'll email you to let you know which charity or charities were selected. So they tell you where it went. Uh, and, and what we expect your donation will accomplish. I'm just telling you, man, in this holiday season, if you're planning on giving money or donating something, like, it, can you think of any better way? Which, again, you look at, and none of those things sound super sexy, 
right? You know what I mean? None of those nets, the, uh, deworming, like st- you know what I mean? Yeah. Like no, and, but I mean, what what is it? I'm just saying, yeah. If you're inspired by the holiday season to give, great, and, use that momentum. Yeah. If you're if you're hesitant for all the reasons we went over, this what is it? Givewell.org. Yeah. Givewell.org. Is, that, that I mean that legit cut through my hesitancy because you see it like right there. You it's. I mean, I love that it's evidence based, uh, it, and it's designed to. What's that cool sentence at the top that maximizes impact? Oh high, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They say, well, donate to high impact, cost effective charities backed by evidence and analysis, and this is updated annually. So mm-hmm. every year they update this. Yeah, like it answers like, does it work? Yes. Uh, is it cost effective? Yes. How do we know? Well, there's evidence and analysis. That, that's that's perfect because right. those are a lot of the reasons that kind of keep my uh, wallet closed. Well, a couple of other know. things is they're donating based on evidence, not marketing. Like even well-meaning charities can fail to have an impact. We provide evidence-backed analysis of effectiveness. So sometimes I see like, you know, um, I don't know. I always think about those, those, uh, <laughs> Those those charities back in the day when I had like Sally Struthers, you know, I always think of that. Donate to. I'm like, why don't you help that kid? You're right there. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dude, South Park roasted her, man. Dude, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, there was a Dane Cook thing on that too, where he's like, where he's like uh, talking about give these. <laughs> it was I can't I can't do it, but he did. It was so, so funny. They were making fun of that, but basically, yeah. those are the type of marketing things that I really think. Pull and I think that the marketing people and these are commercials after all. These are, but I don't. I've never in my life seen a commercial for any of those things ever. Not once, right? Yeah, never. So I'm just saying that, like, I guess that's the point, right? But they're saying, well, yeah. Why would they make an advertisement when it costs so little to give to this? You know what I mean? And they're just doing this. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? And they and they're. They're giving because I've never heard of GiveWell until I looked into this. May, yeah. And maybe I'm an idiot. I don't know, but it seemed to me. I'm just saying I'm a big fan of evidence based practice. And really, what this turned into, um, and they say this in our when they train us, is this is more about evidence based decision making. When you're a, as a clinician, when you're trying to make better decisions for the betterment of your client and more effective decisions for your client, well, we have statistics to drive those decisions. Don't rely on your judgment alone because we get invested in our clients. We have a bias towards our clients and right, wrong, or indifferent. We want to believe in the best in them. And we kind of have our own ideas based on personal experience with them and, and our own lives on what the best you know recommendation is for this. But we're right less than 50% of the time. Most, so if we use evidence to drive those decisions, we're going to make more of an impact of our, on our clients. And same thing here. Like don't donate to that family now. <laughs> don't be like, I, I think I'll hey, do both. Hey, yeah, I hosted I, a podcast yeah. and uh, unfortunately, yeah. never mind. <laughs> 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 Little kids like, <laughs> yeah. I take the present you out of his You literally take yeah. it out of his yeah. hands and say, sorry, yeah, kid, yeah. this is going to some nets. Yeah, we're getting some nets. <laughs> <laughs> you just give him a net. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, so so don't oh, do that. Man. But I'm saying like yeah. this this will for sure change my trajectory on decisions for yep. charities. Absolutely, in the future. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of exciting because I I hope uh, I hope any of our folks at uh, UCCI hear this and and know that our evidence based decision making goes beyond just treatment at this point. So thanks, Jamie and Eric. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully this is helpful for you guys. And so now now you know how to make better decisions when it comes to your charity donations. Yeah. So you can thank us. With you're welcome. Yeah, how many kids you saved in sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah. Okay, we'll see. Oh, should we do it? See you next year, folks. And thanks for listening to the Gorilla Social Work Podcast with your hosts Jeff Moore and Mace Warren. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into all things related to forensic psychotherapy. As always, you can head over to utahsbesttherapy.com to check out our program and check out all the links and resources in the show notes. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and wherever you prefer to get your listener fix. Please share this episode with your family and friends, and don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star rating, which really helps us out. You guys are awesome. We'd like to stay in chat longer, but we're lying. Good night.